Hey there. All right. Take it away, folks. Okay, so I'm going to try this and hopefully um, <clears throat> you will be able to see my screen. Can everyone see that? Hopefully. Yeah, it looks good. Okay, great. All right, so I'm going to be tag teaming this with my fellow um, activists um, and organizers um, at 350 and Sunrise and PMPC. And so I'll be sharing this presentation and um, sorry folks, we haven't had a chance to run through the whole thing together. Um, so um, please be patient with us. All right, um, so I'll go ahead and begin and then I'll pass it over to, to, um, to Indy, but let's see. So I wanted to, um, share a quote from a climate scientist named Catherine um, Hayhoe um, from, the, from Tex Texas Tech. She's also the author of a, of a bestseller book called Saving Us, A Climate Scientist's Case for Hope and Healing in a Divided World. <clears throat> and she says, the science is very clear. Our future is still in our hands. The conclusion, the ending has not been written. Our choices make more of a difference today than, than they ever have. We are already moving towards a better future. Um, and so what I wanted to um, let folks know today is that we have actually had some successes um, that through the efforts of um, community-led efforts, we've actually seen some really positive um, actions. And I wanted to invite my, um, my colleague, Indy, to speak a little bit about some of these projects um, on a local level that we've had success in. And um, yeah, just, just to remind all of us that there's so much that we can do. Jenna. Um... I'm going to give like a super quick overview of some of these because we could dig so much deeper, but I think definitely just want to echo uh, Jenna here and say there are so many ways in which we are winning. And I think when the climate crisis feels overwhelming, uh, it's really important to remember uh, the inroads that we are making. Um, but I also want to take the chance to highlight the ways in which the road has been harder than it that it has to be. And I think that's why all of us are here today um, to have the opportunity to change the rules uh, and change the playing field that many of us are trying to win these very basic and essential environmental and climate protections uh, for our communities. Um, I should suppose I should probably introduce myself as well uh, for those I haven't met yet. Hi, my name is Indy. I usually hear they pronouns. I'm the coalition manager on staff at 350PDX. I get to work with Jenna and Danielle quite a bit, and I'm really happy to be here today uh, and helping to play a small part in moving this process forward. Um, I've been working in and around climate policy uh, at the city level primarily for the past few years, um, getting to step up to some statewide work recently. Um, and I've gotten to see, I'd say, a decent chunk of how climate and environmental stuff happens in the city of Portland. Um, we've had a lot of really exciting moves made, and um, my hope is that we continue in the future to move forward to uh, even bigger leaps as the crisis worsens and, and our calls to action grow louder. Um, the Portland Clean Energy Fund was passed here in a ballot measure in 2018. Uh, that measure was run and created uh, by uh, communities of color uh, and low-income folks, people experiencing the worst impacts of environmental injustice and climate change already, uh, and is now distributing $60 million a year uh, directly to community-led uh, projects and investments in clean energy, uh, green workforce development, green infrastructure, all of these things that uh, are not only going to help um, really offset the, the massive extraction of wealth and resources from the communities that have, that have traditionally not had access to these things, um, but will also uh, help make our city more resilient and able to adapt to the crisis to come um, really across the board. Uh, I see this as a really exciting, uh, an exciting moment for our city to lead. Um, 
this is the first one in the country and we're getting to have a lot of conversations with folks all over uh, about what this could look like for their communities. Um, this past year, uh, we once again uh, won a denial of the permit for the uh, Zenith facility in the Northwest Industrial Sanctuary. Um, this is a, a, an oil by rail facility that was shipping massive amounts, uh, has been shipping massive amounts of um, crude oil by rail um, through our city, through some of our you know, most vulnerable neighborhoods. Folks were already experiencing worse pollution um, and are now experiencing worse risks from uh, an accident, a derailment like we saw in uh, the gorge in, I think, 2017. Um, if the decision stands, they're of course challenging it in court. Uh, that facility will need to phase out and eventually shut down uh, within the next several years. Um, it's hard to get a fossil facility, a fossil fuel facility that is already in operation shut down. So I cannot overstate how massive of a win this is. Um, stopping the Klamath refinery, um, also Jordan Cove um, as a statewide win. Um, we are doing a lot of amazing work to shut down fossil fuels across the state and uh, particularly those that expose the communities here in the Portland metro area. Um, we also won, you know, the, the country's fastest uh, clean energy timeline this past legislative session in 2021, as well as some really essential community benefits, protections for uh, low income residents to make sure folks energy bills aren't going up as a result of this change. Um, uh, some really, uh, I'm sorry, I'm like getting lost in it because it's some really incredible wins so much in the last year. Um, but particularly when it comes to the city of Portland, um, the hurdles we have to jump here are higher than they need to be. We have a form of government that uh, frequently is not effectively responsive to uh, what communities are asking for, um, testifying to, uh, and where agency heads in the form of, of commissioners change so frequently that establishing continuity and momentum on any projects is something we've really had to, had to struggle for. Um, this is certainly what we've been seeing with the climate emergency declaration, which uh, had the moment to be the governing document for how the city does climate. Um, but we've seen so much change over in the last few years that it's been really hard to, to even get our footing on it. Um, I'm seeing Jim saying this is exactly our experience in advocating for participatory budgeting. Absolutely. Um, when you've got, you know, our, our electeds also having to be responsible for running these bureaus that um, really need that continuity and we need that, that history and that momentum because city bureaucracies don't move that fast. Um, we're going to see it in every corner, every project that's really necessary for the people of our city. Um, we're also seeing commissioners who aren't necessarily representative of the communities that are being impacted by these policies. And finally, there's all sorts of opportunities that we're seeing other, other municipalities, other cities, other states taking up to really start moving the needle on climate. Um, and at this time, we're just not taking those opportunities. And I think I'm gonna pass it forward to Jenna or Danielle. I'm not sure if, which one of y'all is speaking to some of the research, but I think they're gonna talk a little bit about what could be on the menu if we if we worked with this more explicitly in our city's charter process? Thanks, thanks so much. All right. Um, okay. So let me. Pardon me. I think we're both double sh um, share screening, um, and it's a little bit of a pause. Um, let's see. Okay, here we go. All right. Okay, thanks so much for, for your patience. Um, let me go ahead and go down to the next one. Okay. So I've been doing some research along with my my Fellow, um, <clears throat> my fellow activists at 350 PDX. And we've been researching on what other cities and states are doing as far as their charter related to climate justice, racial justice, and then um, addressing houselessness. And <clears throat> so we've been looking at various cities and states and um, one of the cities that we looked at was looking at New York 
And what's exciting is that they actually have three um, amendments um, that are being proposed for their charter, and that's going to go to ballot in November 2022. And <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to go ahead and go on to the next slide. And this would be to add um, some language into their um, into their charter that would be including a vision and a value statement for a just and equitable city for all New Yorkers. And it would also require citywide and agency specific racial equity plans every two years in order to reduce and eliminate racial disparities. And then lastly, it would create a commission on racial equity um, appointed by city elected officials. Um, and in making a, appointments to the, the commission, <clears throat> the Racial um, Equity Commission, elected officials would be required to consider appointees who are representatives um, or have experience um, in their communities. Um, okay. Right. And I wanted to um, highlight some of my um, my my fellow um, activists at 350 PDX um, as a part of the subgroup with Watchdog. And um, they were a part of um, working with me and pulling up a lot of this information um, related to other cities and states, and then looking at climate as an intersectional issue with things like houselessness. Um, one of my um, fellow um, colleagues um, did a testimony to the city commissioners really outlining how climate justice is intricately tied um, with dealing with houselessness. And so people in the houseless community are at higher risk for adverse effects of climate, as well as cold and heat events. Um, they have very little protection um, and are extremely vulnerable to extreme weather events. <clears throat> Okay, um, and so the par part of the testimony statement was bringing out the fact that the representation in the Portland's um, city commissioner um, form of government does not equally represent people who live throughout Portland. So people who live east of 82nd Avenue, um, for example, are not well represented. Um, and so um, one of my fellow colleagues who had done a, um, a testimony, um, Anthony, he went ahead and really testified about how a multi-member geographic uh, electric district with proportional representation um, would be a much more better represent representative of Portlanders um, and be able to fight for some of the issues that they also care about. Um, sorry, next slide. And one of the things that, that he, um, Anthony, as well as uh, other members of our, of our team that we thought was really important was to ensure that a standalone subcommittee on climate and environmental justice would be able to gather the information and the experts from all of the different areas that are impacted um, that actually are related to addressing um, climate issue in a very comprehensive way, in a very full scope way. It's gonna take every one of us to address this as a city. And um, next slide, please. And so um, learning from other other um, other cities, other states, as well as even other countries, um, some of the language, oops, this is not, um, we borrowed from Canada's national housing strategy, which is that they actually have a long-term vision um, that recognizes the importance of housing in achieving social, economic, health, and environmental goals. Next slide. 
And so actually instituting it within um, <clears throat> their, their constitution and establishing national goals related to housing and homelessness and identifying related priorities, initiatives, timelines, and desired outcomes is a way that they are uh, formalizing it within their government to be able to address these issues more comprehensively. Next slide. Um, and I think we can learn from their commitment to providing processes to ensure that, um, that different stakeholders, vulnerable groups, people with lived experience of housing needs, as well as those who have lived experience with homelessness are a part of the solutions, are a part of coming up with the solutions. Um, the next slide, please. Um, so some of the research uh, that the watchdog subgroup at 350 um, have conducted <clears throat> was on different cities and how many of them are including these types of provisions in their um, city charter. And Baltimore, for example, in 2018 passed a charter amendment to create an equity assistance fund um, that was used to exclusively used to assist efforts to reduce in inequity based on race, gender, and economic status, including programs in equity and housing, education, city budget spending, and eliminating structural and institutional racism. And what we can learn in Portland is including some of these provisions, including environmental justice provisions and centering frontline communities in any proposed charter amendments. While the city of Portland has various bureaus, including um, on equity, justice and planning and transportation, it lacks a mandate in the charter to actually um, help prioritize and lead this effort. And we have inadequate funding um, and a lack of coordination with the different bureaus, which really dilutes the accountability and be able to identify who's in charge and who's ultimately accountable um, to the public that these things get done. Next slide. Okay, and um, Boston is another example um, of city charters that have established, like we heard from Armani White, they've instituted a participatory budgeting uh, provision. Um, and also their city charter um, <clears throat> establishes a public facilities commission, as well as a public improvement commission and a conservation commission, as well as wetlands protection and climate adaptation. Uh, what I really noticed in the research um, was that the fact that the Conservation Commission is, they can actually deny permission for any activity that would actually cause harm. Um, and they, they could actually um, take action to be able to say, hey, this is causing um, environmental harm. Um, and it's actually, um, you have to prove that what you're doing is not gonna actually degrade uh, the environment further or cause, um, you know, degradation of public land. And, and to me, that is a huge turning point, I think, in a capitalistic economy in which um, the preference has been given to actually businesses um, to be able to just um, give permits uh, without them having to actually prove that their actions are not going to damage the environment. So Boston is really taking a lead in that. Um, next slide, please. And then Honolulu, as Danielle mentioned, they've actually passed um, a charter amendment that creates an Office of Climate Change, Sustainability and Resiliency. And that's one way that Portland can learn, uh, learn from by actually creating an office to highlight the importance of this issue and give it the visibility as well as the funding and accountability that it needs. Next slide. Um, Seattle um, also has something stating that um, protecting health, protecting the environment, protecting the welfare of the people. And these types of amendments, which my, um, my colleague, Jill Morby, she did a lot of research on other states, as well as um, other cities and countries. 
and um, that they're instituting a, like a green amendment, which is specific language to protect the environment, to protect people as a, as a mandate. And so more and more states and cities are looking at green amendments, and that's something that Portland should absolutely consider um, in, our, in our charter change. Next slide, please. Um, Salt Lake City was surprising, surprisingly innovative in that they actually have eight separate sustainability policies that are related to environmental practices, energy efficiency and waste minimization, and a number of other areas, including recycling and planning. Um, and it takes up 20 different pages um, in the language. And it's something that actually Portland can take seriously and learn from to be able to institute these provisions into our own, into our own charter. Next slide. Um, I'm not gonna go heavily into New York, um, but, but New York um, has really um, got cracking in terms of creating various task forces to come up with a city-wide plan to be able to deal with climate um, adaptation and mitigation. Um, and it's relying heavily on, on these advisory boards and panels to come up with this type of strategy. Um, and, and I think we should consider the same and also consider um, funding um, stipends you know, for the labor and expertise that's gonna be required by a number of different organizations and individuals to be able to make this very comprehensive. Next slide. Um, thanks you guys for helping me with the, with the slides and can you pass it to the next one, if you would? Thank you. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and, um, now pass this on to my colleague, Danielle Millard, um, activist, um, as well as, um, fellow organizer at PMPC and Sunrise, um, to give an update on her, a recent city charter commissioner meeting that she had. We're over time. Do we want to hop to the next section, Emory? Oh, thanks. Um, Danielle, yeah, if you'd like to just kind of briefly wrap up and yeah, then we can head to our next um, section. Thanks so much. Sometimes things go a little over and that's expected. Okay, perfect. I'll just give a quick update on kind of where we are at with um, EJ stuff. I've had an opportunity to talk with a lot of commissioners, a lot of community members, and basically just want to um, say that sometimes these things are hard to organize and get attention for. And there's like two general ways to get commissioners ears is money or people power. And we're really trying to like advance that people power for this. And something cool is that there's been a total at this point now, I believe over 800 co public comments, but in end of December, 699, 12% of those had mentioned climate justice. And then with the work we've been doing and outreach and community members really standing up and being involved in this process from just November to December, when we were doing a huge chunk of outreach and other groups were as well, and people were coming to these tables, that number raised to 35% of these comments talking about climate justice. And so the more we're able to get this talked about because the people that it's really affecting don't always have the time, the energy, the money to be at these tables where there is a lot of power. So the more kind of we're able to talk and collaborate and be in groups with each other and talk about how important this is and the intersections between this, um, the better. So our words matter, being at the table matters, it's getting people's voices to be heard is really important. Um, and also for our the supplies for participatory budgeting and our the other things we're going to talk about. So I'll pass it over now. Um, All right, thank you. Could we say one final thing? I wanted to just um, uh, remind folks that um, I'm going to pass it to Indy on the follow up survey and toolkit that's coming. Definitely. Um, thanks, Jenna. I do actually have a quick like action item. If folks are feeling motivated about this or you want to learn more, um, I'm going to share as soon as my internet starts agreeing with me in the chat, 
a little toolkit you can use to submit testimony, just like Danielle was saying. Um, one of the biggest things we can be doing right now is just getting the word out and in front of charter commissioners. Um, thank you to the commissioners that are on this call today. I'm really glad to have you here um, to be able to just start sharing some of the, the options that we heard today, some of the things that other cities are doing and why this is critical to be thinking about now in phase one, even when there's so many changes that we can be making. So if you're interested in taking action, um, I am going to drop a toolkit link in the chat that you can use to write the charter commission. Um, there's instructions in there um, if you'd be willing to reach out with a short letter or an email to them um, that would be a huge help in moving this forward so thank you all and we'll be following up um, after the presentation uh, when you receive a survey for the actual um, event today as well as um, the the toolkit again so um, this is not your only opportunity <laughs> 